Welcome back to Doctrine Forensics. Well, we live in strange times and this COVID-19 situation certainly has all of the fake, phony, and false apostles and prophets telling us what thus saith the Lord is. Well, I decided that I would approach this from a teaching standpoint to educate those who care, maybe you care, maybe you don't, about a question. And the question is, are apostles and prophets still for the church today? Well, our friends over at BibleIssues.org penned an article some time ago that is still applicable for today, but it seems like the charismatic movement has still obfuscated from the truth of the Word of God and what it says about both those offices. So we're going to take a deep dive into what the Bible says about this, and you will get to make up your own mind about whether or not apostles and prophets are still for the church today based upon the Word of God. We're going to get into this in just a second. There are people today who claim to be apostles and prophets and actually add these titles to their names. Apostle so-and-so will be ministering in this church or prophet so-and-so said that there will be an earthquake. They claim that the five-fold ministry has been restored. Does the Bible teach us to expect apostles and prophets today or were they specifically for the early church? Good question. If they were for the early church only, then what do we conclude about modern day apostles and prophets? Are they misguided souls or are they evil seducers? By definition, the word apostle means ambassador, someone who was sent on behalf of another for a specific purpose. The one sent usually carried the full authority of the sender. Now, those sent by God with his message were apostles. The word apostle is used in different ways in the New Testament. Sometimes it refers to a special group of people who held the office of the apostle, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, where it reads, And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administration, and then variety of tongues. The original twelve, and then later Matthias, were clearly distinct from other apostles. They were granted special reward in the New Jerusalem. And in Revelation 21.14, it clearly says that now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now keep in mind, no one else could attain this, not even Paul. Clearly, these 12 apostles were very unique. But there were also other apostles who were commissioned by Christ, Paul being the most noteworthy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 7 and 9, it says, After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Paul indicates that one of the criteria for being an apostle was have to have been seen Jesus personally and being personally commissioned by him. Now, this was true of the 12 and also with Paul. I refer to these people as the major apostles. Now, more broadly, those who work with the major apostles were also called minor apostles. And a good example of this would be Barnabas. The function of apostle is pretty unique. Ephesians 2.20 says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, contrary to popular belief, the apostles' job was not to plant churches. This fell underneath their jurisdiction, but this was not their primary function. Their main function was to establish the faith. Jesus Christ died once and for all to become the chief cornerstone of the Christian faith. 
The purpose of the apostles was to establish the faith and to build a doctrinal foundation on which the church would be based. They were especially commissioned by God to do this. In John chapter 14, verse 26, and in John 16, verses 12 through 14, Jesus promised the apostles that the Holy Spirit would come and reveal to them what they needed to know. Now, people incorrectly apply these verses to us and teach that the Holy Spirit could reveal anything to us, including answers to a test. In an indirect sense, these verses apply to all of us in that the Holy Spirit teaches us how to apply God's word, that's the written word, and brings it to our remembrance. But these words were directly spoken to the original apostles who physically heard Jesus. This promise was fulfilled when the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to write what Jesus said and what was yet to be said, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and verse 12. Thus, it was important for them to have physically seen him. Later on, Paul was commissioned as an apostle to the Gentile in the same way Peter was an apostle to the Jews. To put it loosely, the primary job of the apostle was to give us the New Testament. Every book in the New Testament was written by an apostle or a close associate of the apostles, such as Luke. Peace be unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer. Jesus gave us the New Testament, the covenant through his blood, and the apostles gave us the New Testament, which is the doctrine through their writings and teaching. This is the meaning of Ephesians 2.20. Now, once the foundation has already been laid, according to Jude, it is time to build on it. Jude 3 says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to all the saints. So the foundation does not need to be laid again any more than Christ has to die again. Therefore, there is no need for apostles today. I'll say that again. There's no need for apostles today. Now it is time for pastors, evangelists, and teachers to build, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 10, which reads, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believe? As the Lord gave to each one, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God is the one who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it but let each one take heed on how he builds on it. Simply put, Paul laid the foundation and Apollos built on it. Thus, in a primary sense, there are no more apostles. However, people who establish churches, heads of denominations, etc., may call themselves apostles. They just cannot claim to be infallibly sent by God to bring a new revelation to the body of Christ as were the major apostles of the Bible. Paul's writings were infallible. 1 Corinthians 2, 13 says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teach, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. And then second Peter chapter three, verse 15. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother, Paul, according to the wisdom given to him has written to you. And in verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which some things are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destructions as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So this is where Peter placed Paul's writings on the same level as the Old Testament. The same cannot be said of any modern day apostles. Prophet, by definition, was someone who spoke authoritatively on behalf of God. Their message usually consisted of presenting exhortation or warning based upon a future prediction. The function of an Old Testament prophets, they were God's primary mean of communicating to the people. They did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, so they needed revelation via third party. Second Peter chapter 3 Verse 2 seems to say that the New Testament apostles were equivalent to the Old Testament prophets. Now, although the prophets are given to the church, New Testament prophets were different from the Old Testament prophets. Much of the writings of the Old Testament prophets were canonical. They became scriptures. In the Old Testament, there is canonical prophecy although to a lesser extent than there is in the Old Testament, as well as non-canonical prophecy. So the book of Revelation is an example of canonical prophecy. Abacus, who was a prophet in Acts 11, 28, and Acts 21, 10, and those given to the Corinthian church were non-canonical in that they were not binding prophecies on believers as scriptures. So Paul actually chose to disregard one of Abacus's prophecies in Acts chapter 21, verses 13 and 14. Non-canonical prophecy is directed to a specific group of people or congregation under certain circumstances. It does not apply to all the believers of all time. Let it be said, though, that if both, if genuine, are God's words. Ephesians 2.20 has in mind all prophetic and apostolic work that constituted the doctrinal foundation of the church. This included the Old Testament prophets, New Testament apostles, and New Testament prophets. Now, I believe that there still may be prophets of the caliber of Agabus and those who minister with the gift of prophecy, congregational, not canonical. Their focus is not just predicting the future like some palm reader or fortune teller, but instead should guide believers in how to prepare for future events. For example, a prophet may tell you that God wants to use you as a pastor, but you need to spend more time in prayer. Too often, I've seen prophets giving people personal revelations about their future without demanding righteousness or holiness. And of course, there's no obligation to give any financial offering in return. Wink, wink. In conclusion, there may still be apostles as church planners and heads of denomination. There may still be non-canonical prophets like Agabus and those in the Corinthian church. There are no longer prophets like John the Revelator, Moses, or Elijah. Neither are there apostles like Paul or Peter. Their work is finished. The only other kind of apostles and prophets the Bible speaks about now are false ones. Their work has never ceased. Now, without calling names, I believe that there are many of them today, even in the church. In fact, Acts 20, 30 says it best. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. 
What the church needs today is evangelists, pastors, and teachers, as well as laymen, to build on the foundation already laid to contend for the faith once and for all that was delivered to the saints. Jude 3. I want to thank you for listening to Doctor and Forensics. If you like this material, please click, like, subscribe, comment, and share. God bless you and your family.